Well, uh, Daniel, thank you so much for helping my project. Could you say a few words about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Daniel Cox. I uh, live in the state, of, great state of Montana. Um, I uh, work in the medical field. I'm a, I'm a pharmacist. And yeah, so that's a little bit about me. That's, uh, that's interesting. I, I know that we met this morning on this global chat of, of English learners. Um, and I was just thinking through about how I got uh, into that chat. And I think it was uh, Hong uh, Wen that had introduced me to Shashiraj, uh, who uh, invited me to this morning. I was just wondering how you got involved. Uh, same thing. I was part of another, another group. I got to know Huang and then, you know, she invited me to her groups and then, uh, yeah, same thing. I just, uh, got on a couple of zoom calls and just kind of got to know a lot of different people from that. So. It's really interesting. I, I've actually learned a lot about English from seeing that like, there's some phrases that I had never heard before and, you know, might be common in other parts of the English speaking world. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of learned that as well, especially, you know, talking like people from India who learn, you know, the England style of English versus American. And so, it, you know, it's, it's uh, interesting just seeing, you know, different perspectives from these, you know, uh, countries have been influenced by other like, you know, New Zealand or Australia or the UK, you know, their versions of English as compared to America's. So. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, even I, I went to um, uh, London and to York and Edinburgh uh, last year in February uh, about this time. And I did these interviews along the way with people I met. I know it's kind of interesting, uh, the different types of accents you have. You, I mean, there's so much variety, even with inside of England itself. Yep. Yeah, I, uh, I lived in Argentina for two years. And it was interesting seeing some of the expatriated people there from America and there was one guy from Scotland and he had this little garbage can just said British rubbish and it just had the the British uh, flag on it was it was kind of interesting never quite understood uh, understood the inside joke with him and a couple of the other people but you know it was just interesting there wasn't a lot of Americans down there at the time but there was a few and it was always interesting to see you know them living down there and working down there as compared to the you know, the other people there. And, you know, I think I've developed an accent from someplace. I've lived in Texas all my life, except for one year when I moved to New Hampshire, but uh, somehow I don't sound like a Texan. It's always been kind of a mystery to me. Yeah, yeah, I'd say I, I wouldn't have pegged you from Texas. Um, well, I, I wanted to ask you about us planning to send astronauts to the moon in 2024. Is this something you have heard about before? Uh, not a lot. I'd seen in the media, I think like China and a couple other people were planning uh, missions to the moon. But uh, ever since our space program fell apart, you know, 10 years ago, I hadn't heard any plans of NASA or anybody else really returning to the moon. You know, I know Elon Musk was planning on sending people to uh, Mars um, with the, I think was SpaceX was the program, you know, his company was doing, but hadn't heard anything from America planning on sending anybody to the moon that soon. Yeah, NASA has been working on building this uh, huge rocket called the uh, SLS. It's made out of the same components as the space shuttle was made out of. And uh, it might have its first test launch later this year or next year, but it's supposed to send um, astronauts around the moon. And then they have uh, three teams of companies competing to build the actual landing system that would meet up with the capsule around the moon and take them to the surface and back up. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, SpaceX uh, is amazing. You know, they're able to launch uh, astronauts to the International Space System, uh, space Station. Um, and, um, and in fact, there's an opportunity this month um, for people who are giving to St. Jude's to actually enter a drawing to, to ride on a, a SpaceX Dragon later this year, which would be a, kind of interesting. That, that would be interesting. That would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, but do you know the last time we went to the moon? Oh, it was well before I was born. And I think the last couple missions were like the early 70s. 
1972 was the last time, uh, which was uh, before I was born too. And and before the previous NASA administrator, Jim Bridenstine, he was also born in uh, 75, three years after the last time. He was the first NASA administrator to be born after Apollo. That's interesting. And I don't think we have that many moonwalkers left. There's There were six landings on the moon, each with two astronauts, so 12 astronauts. And uh, I think out of that 12, there may only be like four or five of them alive. And of course, they're in their 90s. Yeah, yeah. I heard too, they lost the plans for like the Saturn V rocket, you know, that they'd use to take, you know, people to the moon, which when I'd heard that, I was like, yeah, that's that's kind of interesting. You would think they would have, uh, even just for historical purposes, they would have kept better, you know, track of where those plans were at. But you know, even with excellent plans, there's a bit of tradecraft uh, that you need that also requires having trained, experienced people who are able to put those plans in into operation. Something as simple as cooking. I find uh, following the directions don't always produce the right results. Well, a lot of those components were done by hand, especially, you know, like the plating and stuff on, on the rockets. So yeah, there was a lot of trade craft going on and it would be, you'd have a hard time probably finding some of the original people who were on the ground actually physically building the components for that. And. You know, uh, SpaceX has received a lot of criticism for their Starship program that's in Brownsville, Texas, um, in a place called Boca Chica, where they're actually building the Starship prototypes. It's supposed to be a 100% reusable vehicle that can carry 100 people to space at a time and would be cheapest per launch because it's 100% reusable. And right. um, they've they've did little test flights with two of them. They both um, took off fine. Uh, they both flew fine, uh, and they put the crater exactly where they wanted it. But uh, the landing needs a little work. <laughs> but interesting, going to be uh, kind of kind of neat. He's talking about building two of these a week. Each of these would be able to do three flights a day. So if he's able to realize that vision, you know, the scale would be amazingly different than what we have now. Definitely. You have to have the destinations and the justification for making them first, because you'd have to have established things on both the moon and probably Mars as well to make it worthwhile, you know, to construct these and, you know, and send them out. And then, of course, we'd have to find a way to travel a lot faster than we are able to right now. So. Yeah, indeed. And, you know, that's a, a challenge. Um, it takes like somebody visionary doing something non-economically driven to actually go and create the conditions for others to follow doing yes. things that are economically Correct. driven. Correct. Uh, I, how do we get such people? Like where do they come from? They, uh, they bring those drives with them from, other, from before they were born here, I'm sure. And what do you think about our plans to land people on the moon? Um, is it something that you're supportive of or you're like why are we doing this um you know what i i say why not i mean it's just another part to explore to learn more about god's great universe and how this works you know as long as we're not putting military installations with nukes aimed at anybody you know on the moon you know i i don't have a problem with it yeah of course, you know, putting uh, uh, nukes uh, on the moon, at least we would have a three-day warning before they got to, to Earth. True, true. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I better. guess I hadn't, I guess I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, true. Um, let's see, uh, if it was safe and affordable, would you take a trip to space? I probably would, yeah. And uh, how, be fun. how safe would it need to be? You know, if it were about as safe as like what air travel is now, you know, I probably would, you know, if they make it uh, extremely inconvenient because of security protocols, I may take a pass, but, but yeah, you know, if it was like how easy it was to fly during the seventies and early parts of the eighties and you could come and go as you pleased and it was affordable. Yeah, probably would. It'd be fun. And whenever you kind of think out to like 500 years in the future, 
which is about the same length of time as from now to Christopher Columbus coming to the, the new world. Do you see humanity still pretty much on the earth making these little side trips to places? Or do you think we've actually really expanded the bubble of civilization to encompass uh, other places in the solar system? You know, considering the fact that, you know, our world is unique in the solar system and you've got a lot of psychological and a lot of other factors that go into our happiness besides just, you know, exploring meat in new places. So if you say, if we were able to terraform like Mars uh, in order to be a lot more like earth, I, I could definitely see us expanding well beyond that. You know, if we don't develop such technologies and the planets remain much like they are with the exception of, you know, little hamster habit trail things for people, you know, on the moon's surface or Mars' surface, it may not expand much beyond that. Um, but those, that kind of technology could develop into its own thing uh, as well. Um, you know, I'm thinking back to the, uh, that, Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, I can't remember what it was called, but you know, where they went on Mars, you know, so if something like that, something like that could potentially build up as well. But as far as like, at least for myself, you know, I probably, probably if I were alive, you know, at that time, which I wouldn't be, but it, you know, I would probably stay more earthbound unless, you know, I had other options for worlds that were more earth-like without having to go outside in a suit i know it'd be very limiting i often thought that too you know just being able to go out on my backyard and front yard is uh, such a big psychological release um that but then i i've been to places like uh, minneapolis where they have the the skywalk uh, which is like right. this second level thing that connects a whole bunch of buildings. And some of those buildings have huge atriums. And I, I right. got to imagine it'd be sort of like that at some point. Yeah, because I, I, I look back at like the movie Martian, you know, and all the, the nitty gritty stuff he had to do to survive and grow food and made me a lot more appreciative of the designs that God put into this world when he set it in motion to make sure that people and animals and plants had everything they needed to do to grow and be happy and do their thing. Yeah, it's a really amazing system, completely recycling, you know, the things that were alive become the, the food and materials for the, the next cycle. Right. We need to figure you know, out. And I, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, as I was say, you know, and I look at other, you know, other sci-fi things like, uh, you know, Battlestar Galactica, when they had that one ship, I think it was the, the Rising Sun or something like that, where they actually had like sun-like, they had like actually had a sun and they had like a park kind of atmosphere, but it was this contained environment. Or uh, another anime I grew up with, Robotech, you know, inside the SDF-1, which stands for Super Dimensional Fortress, they actually... Does, they had this whole entire city inside this thing because when they folded and ended up on the other side of Pluto, they took a big chunk of the island and part of the people with them. <laughs> so they rebuilt inside the ship, but then they actually had a sun, a sun cycle inside that they came up with where the sun would rise and set and psychologically be like it was on Earth. So I'm like, that's kind of an interesting technology aspect, it, you know, because a lot of the other sci-fi I've seen is, you're pretty much inside this little metal tube going somewhere, but you know, you didn't have the other natural parts of home, you know, to help keep people grounded and a lot more psychologically stable. Yeah, it's uh, going to be interesting. I was also thinking about the Truman show uh, where they have that artificial world and the, the guy yes. grows up. <laughs> yep. So that's kind of neat. Which, oddly enough, they had, I think that was based on another Twilight Zone episode, you know, like the new Twilight Zones back in the 80s, where they had a guy whose life was being recorded and then transmitted on cable. And then one day he's sitting there shaving in the mirror and the corner comes down, he sees his camera watching him. And so the whole, <laughs> the, you know, the, the, the whole gag was blown. And so it, all of a sudden all his fans come out who had signed this document to, for secrecy to not blow the 
the, the cover that this man's entire life had been basically a, a construct and for everybody else's entertainment to watch from wow. his marriage to his job to everything else. And do you ever get a sense of that? Uh... I, sometimes I feel like my life is like that. I'm just like I'm waiting for the camera to be, you know. Uh, like with the old uh, Star Trek Next Generation, start hitting the wall to see if it uh, goes into the black and yellow pattern of the holodeck. Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> the sign of the forge. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's really neat. Well, I, I really appreciate uh, you talking to me. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get a chance to? Um, yeah, yeah, I just, you know, because you wondered where like the, this genius and stuff, you know, had come from, uh, you know, part of its genius and part of it, I think also is where society is willing to, to go as well, you know, because you look at like Christopher Columbus, you know, a lot of the people didn't really want to travel outside of their little area of the world, but you know, with, with that, we ended up with a, a lot more knowledge in spite of, you know, the, the down downsides of that too, you know, there's always a up and a down to technology. It's, you know, it's what we do with it. It's not necessarily technology itself is bad. Um, so, you know, I, I, I guess I, you know, I, I find that interesting and, you know, I find it interesting, you know, as, as advanced as we get in the technology, there's just certain things that, uh, God does. He just he just does better, and I, I've just found it interesting as we've tried to learn why that works. We come out with with a lot more interesting, uh, a lot more interesting things. Yeah, indeed. I mean, there's so much about the way the world's put together that we're still trying to figure out. Where our knowledge, I, I think the the what we're learning most about is the the depth and uh, length of our ignorance, as opposed to. You know, we're learning how big the puzzle is as opposed to learning exactly. all the pieces. Exactly. You know, and I find it's interesting too, because you know, it's like Legos, you know, you have the pieces, but then it takes somebody's imagination to do something with the pieces. And you take like a group of a group of 10 people and they could take the same pieces and create vastly different, you know, constructions with them, but all of them are interesting and useful, useful, you know, in their own way, whether it's just, something humorous or something actually practically useful. Yeah, and I'm sure if they each saw the results, they would be inspired for even more and different things. It's kind of important for exactly. us to share and motivate, inspire. Yeah, I remember watching, you know, Star Wars, you know, growing up as a kid and, you know, when Luke loses his hand and then he gets that mechanical hand afterwards. And, you know, I kind of did, did some thinking over the years after that, I'm like, you know, that is kind of cool, but for me, what would be better is not just replacing it with some, a machine to learn to regrow and remake that and attach it perfectly like it had never been severed, you know? That would require art and skill uh, to do such a thing. And a belief that it's possible. I think that's what holds us back the most is believing it's possible. Yeah, that is that I found that is probably the the beginning where all of it is because i have seen a lot of people in my life just kind of scream arrogantly oh geez that'll never happen it, it, and yet be it good or bad it happens you know because somebody won't listen to that and they fight to learn the physical and scientific principles behind it and with a little bit of artistic flair make it happen it is uh, amazing and you know now that so many of us are connected online. I think probably like three or four billion people. Um, I, I mean, we're able to kind of share our insights and experiences and thoughts at such a huge scale. Right, right. You know, you have the the uh, database of the of humanity essentially on the internet of how to how to do all all this stuff and and yeah, it's a you know it's amazing. You know, you if you took somebody from thousands of years ago and showed them what we have now, they would think it would be all magic and sorcery. But yet, you know, it, it works on, uh, you know, principles and laws of physics and chemistry and everything else. Yeah, no, no more magic. Exactly. <laughs> it's magical, but there's 
a way this works and we understand how it works. But, you know, at the same token, uh, the depth of knowledge that you have to know in order to see how it works and like these fields have developed um, their own specialized language and concepts that seem so alien to everybody else. Uh, you also see kind of a regression and, and um, you know, uh, people uh, just not being aware of uh, how things work or how things could work and almost I mean, it's almost uh, like a new priesthood in a way. Yeah, I would, I would say that, you know, I, I tend to be more religious and, uh, you know, cause we were talking about, you know, politics just a little bit in that other, other group and, it, you know, and I don't lean to one side or the other. Um, I more just try to look at what's around me and plod, you know, my way forward through the path that I, I think is best. I mean, I would almost see that's almost like a, like a spiritual war, you know, because if people truly see and they truly have all the information in front of them, then they have the most freedom to act, you know, and, and hopefully choose to do good things with the knowledge in front of them. You know, there is the ability to know how to do something and then the wisdom to know if you should do something with that particular in particular or when and how to use something. Um, you know, and those are two different skill sets. Um, but, you know, the, I, I find as people draw closer to God, as they um, want to know more about him, who, whoever God is for them, it intends to bring light upon the world and allow more good things to happen in higher ways of doing things. And what I've been seeing a lot in, uh, like in America and elsewhere, a lot of people just you know, turning, getting sucked into like the media, entertainment media, fake news media. I don't care if it's CNN or Fox, you know, there's just been a lot of, in my opinion, a lot of propaganda pushed, you know, dividing people left and right and making people hate each other. And, uh, you know, I, that's not what life's about, you know, li life's about seeing each other as we are, you know, human beings, uh, brothers and sisters of the same loving God and treating each other other nicely, you know, we're all going to have different beliefs, but, you know, God is the one uni unifying factor. And the fact that, you know, before we came to this life, we were all brothers and sisters before God, it, you know, for me, is very humbling, you know, and I, as I seen in that other, other uh, international English group, you know, I just see all, all these, you know, different cultures and beliefs and everything, but yet everyone you know, is coming to, at least in that case, just to learn a skill, you know, to just to learn a language better, you, you know, and I, I just find it fascinating that there's a lot more similarities to all of us and there are things to really divide, you know, and if we want to be successful on going to Mars and going to the moon and pursuing these things, you, you know, if you have a wholesale breakdown of the culture and society, none of that would happen because you have to have vast industries to support these kinds of things. You know, you don't just land somebody on Mars willy nilly. You have to have an entire support structure to make that landing happen. And if that breaks down, you know, these wonderful things just don't happen. But yet if we come together and we work together, love one another, put aside the petty grievances and just with whatever task it is being good, just, you know, doing our best efforts to bring something about, we can do amazing things from landing people on the moon to learning how to heal the human body, the heal, heal the human mind and what, what have you. But what I see going on right now, it really is a spiritual war for the soul, hearts and minds of people, both good and bad. And, you know, God is calling people, the other side is calling people and, uh, you know, one other thing I think I see in the next 500 years, whether we expand to other worlds or just do amazing things on this one, I really see uh, technologies and other things happening that we have never known, you know, and I would see in 500 years, in spite of the troubles going on here now, we're going to be in an amazing place. We're going to be in an amazing place and people are going to be a lot more loving and kind towards one another after we figure a few things out going through, you know, what we may go through in the next five to 10 years. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's a challenge. You know, I mean, in Europe, you had, you know, religious intolerance, and you had, um, you know, the plagues, and you right. had kind of uh, an archaic uh, economic system. And, you know, that really drove a lot of people to uh, the Americas uh, to go and strike out anew. And uh, probably without those types of drivers, a lot of people may have been happy to stay in Europe instead of coming to the Americas. And I just wonder if these events like that we have down here actually may be what makes people say, you know, I prefer the natural hardships and the natural risk over the, the human made ones. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll tell you that right now. Um, what all is going on right now is designed to divide people. But in that, we can find joy and happiness. And once we get through these hard times, there will be glorious light and joy for everybody. And it doesn't matter. Nationality language does not matter because that's not who we are. You know, that's not really truly who we are. You know, we are children of God, and those that choose to search for light, choose to live kindly one with another and, and to do all that, and in spite of the deprivations that may happen and the wars and hard stuff, reach out in kindness and in charity to others, those are the people who are going to be your thought leaders. Those are the people who are going to have the wherewithal to bring our civilization into the next stage. Having been tried in those fires, and still willing and still choose to do good, those are the people that will be beacons of light for the sciences and for math and for all other disciplines, you know, that will lead us to where I believe we'll be in 500 years. I definitely hope so. I, th you, I think what you're saying is if you look at survival characteristics, you think uh, love and kindness and um, acceptance are actually things that would make people, um, our groups of people more likely to survive into the future. Correct, but we don't survive without Heavenly Father. We don't survive without Jesus Christ. You, you know, and again, some of my personal beliefs. Um, so, you know, it's, everyone's free to make their own, own decision. But, you know, what, what I see, those are the characteristics that pull us away from the tribalism, that pull us away from, what collapsed Europe into the dark ages and helps carry the, you know, the, the knowledge and the disciplines and everything else that have helped build the wonders that we have in medicine and space travel and communications and everything else and take us to the next level. Yeah, definitely. And I wanted to run uh, uh, something by you and see what your take on it sure. is. Um, so, you know, Jesus told a parable about a landowner going off on a trip and he calls three of his servants and he gives one of them like uh, 50 talents ago and another one like 20, another one 10. I mean, got the, I may have the quantities wrong, but uh, that's, that's not the, the point. And he comes uh, on his, he goes on his trip and he comes back and he, he asks them, um, you know, uh, you know, give an account for what you did. And the, the guy that got 50 says, you know, I invested your 50 talents and I, I doubled them and have a hundred. And the guy that had uh, 20 of them, he's like, I invested them and I was able to double them also. And I got 40. And the guy that had 10, he's like, oh, I'm so scared of losing it that I, I buried it. And here's the 10 that I, I owe you. And the, um, you know, the, the landowner is like, uh, so, uh, upset with the guy's tins, like you should have at least put it in the bank and gotten like the, the interest, you know, and he's like, uh, takes right. the one from the 10 and gives it to the one that, uh, you know, had earned a uh, hundred. And he's like, those who are, are given much, much is expected and those who, uh, you know, uh, and I kind of in, interpret that story to say that we need to make the most of what we're given. And Correct. I would even extend that to say, you know, if we have the ability uh, to go out and explore the rest of the, the solar system and to, to branch out further, then it's almost like, um, I mean, almost feels like a, something we're expected to do, you know, as opposed to just, just staying here on the earth. And I, I, I mean, do you think that's carrying that story too far? Or do you think there's no, like- no, I no, I don't think so at all, because really it's, uh, it's, a it's, it's about principles. 
because the principle there is that, you know, we all have different focuses, you know, I'm in the world of medicine, which is different than, you know, uh, you know, a, a neighbor who would be one of the primary designers and engineers, you know, on SpaceX, which, you know, I don't have any friends like that, but, you know, let's say I did, you know, our, our focuses are different. We both have our talents and our abilities in different things. And there's always a risk, you know, but yet we risk and we do things the best we can. And once we succeed, you know, we get a lot more than what we were, what we were given. And so, yeah, I, I don't see that taking that story too far at all because we all ha we're all different because you know different things are going to make us happy individually. But part of the happiness is taking what we have and giving to others. You know, because <clears throat> like uh, in the space program, we ended up with those cool little gel pens. You know, and you see what kind of a uh, a market those those things have developed. But yet, that's one of those things you wouldn't have foreseen back in the '60s when they were developing uh you know this, this different space technology and so that that's one of the things I, I find that's enriching about life is that you, you know you you've got your thought leaders and we've got directions where the economy and technology goes but then you have these little side branches where you just have these fun little things just pop up and for me that that that's where life has joy is these fun little gags that just kind of become something but it was never the intended focus of these other programs that spawn them. Yeah, side effects, I guess. It, yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely definitely interesting. And uh, what are some of your favorite thought leaders that are alive today? Uh, you know, Hawking's was was very interesting. Um, you know, I I like some of his stuff. Um, I didn't delve deep in, into his stuff. I did a lot more with like uh, uh, like arts and entertainment. Uh, you know, I love Star Trek growing up. I love sci-fi growing up. Uh, Twilight Zone was great, it, it, you know. And, you know, of course, the, these people had, uh, you know, other people on their staff and stuff influencing these stories, it, it, you know, and that, that, that's where I, I tended to go, you know, like Steven Spielberg, uh, you know, George Lucas, you know, Star Wars, uh, Indiana Jones, you know, the... The, those were the things I, I liked, you know, some of the people from Japan, the Japanese animation, you know, the Final Fantasy series, you know, uh, you know, that just introduced me to pieces of these other cultures. And it was it was just great, you know. That, uh, yeah, I, if you like the Twilight Zone, I, I was wondering if you've seen a, a series called Black Mirror. No, I haven't. I've heard about it. I have not seen it yet. I, I feel like it's a modern day Twilight Zone. Like, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Well, I, really... I, I loved Rod Serling growing up, you know. Uh, of course, you know, he did the black and white series, which, you know, my parents grew up with. And then they, you know, he died I, in part when he was doing the, the 1980s series. And it was different than the 50s series, but just as good, in my opinion. I just love the, the voiceovers and the monologues that uh, Rod Serling would always do, you know. He's definitely somebody I would definitely love to, you know, meet someday. And, and uh, you know, if I were ever to do a, a series, I'd love to, you know, it would be just kind of a mishmash of stuff I kind of grew up with. But I would love to have him, you know, doing the voiceover at the beginning or ending of a, of a show, you know, you know, just kind of giving the, the bizarre little moral of it. Yeah, that that is uh pretty important sometimes people walk away with a different understanding of the story uh having it explicitly told um might might help to, to unify people's understanding but uh, it, you know that, that's just kind of a you know that's just kind of the story some of the storytelling i, I you know i like so it, you know well uh, daniel i i really appreciate your time and i um it stay in touch and we should connect we should definitely connect, my friend. Okay. Well, you have All a right. good rest of your day. and I'll You do to you too. Later. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye.